Welcome to episode 12 of Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of Hive1.net, an experimental social discussion platform for truth seekers and activists. I'm the author of a book called Revolutionary Mindfulness. That's about meditation and activism. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, a meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. All right. That was our new intro recorded by me. Welcome to Meditation and Aliens. This is Matt, and Doro is with me as always. Hi, Doro. I'm here. Thanks, Matt. Here we go again. I hope here this is go. a good one. You say you got some good news today, or lots of news. I don't know if it's good, but... Oh, I, I've got some stuff to share. I've got I got several video little clips or audio clips prepped right. for us to... Uh, us to get into. How are you doing this week? I'm doing great. I've really been enjoying the weather here in the mountains of Virginia. Spectacular time for me. I'm just enjoying the the meditation groups that I lead and uh, my clients. Uh, my whole life revolves around my clients. So I'm doing great. They're all doing great. <laughs> and my chickens are doing great. Everybody's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So how many meditation groups do you lead each week? Well, I have a regular one on Fridays, and I uh, sit in sometimes for groups on Wednesdays, um, and I've just not, uh, cut out a couple of groups, so I'm, I'm down to just a couple this week. So, And are they virtual or are they in person? These are virtual, yeah, okay. mostly all virtual. Yeah. I do it through the Instill Mindfulness program, uh, so it's instillmindfulness.org, morning meditations. And can like anyone listening just become involved in these groups or are they kind of closed? No, they're wide open. Anyone can just pop in any morning. There are different teachers for other days of the week. So eight o'clock any morning, that's Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. Uh, we have some one teacher or another sitting in and guiding a meditation from eight to about 840 every morning. Interesting. And do you... Uh... Do you, do people, do you debrief meditation or talk about it after the meditation or? No, this is really just come in, you know, we just ring the bell and start the meditation and then it's over. So okay. no, there's, there's no discussion. Um, but I would like to build up on that. So we'll, we'll see how that goes in the future. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I might have to drop in. On the, I uh, hope you do. Yeah. yeah. Be good. So, right. well, just um, to get on with the show, you've said three times you've got something to share. I can't wait to hear it. I do. I do. Well, let's see. Um, all right. We'll jump into the catch up. Uh, so, of course, the the UAP Disclosure Act was in Congress and it parsh and the big, big, uh, big pieces of it did not pass. But there were several pieces of it did pass. And um so I was just sort of like seeing what's happening in Congress in the world in the weeks, these two weeks uh, after uh, this uh, act has passed. And there's been some news coverage. There's definitely been some uh, mainstream news recognizing that Congress passed an act that talks about non-human intelligence. And the, the act actually says that the government is required to release all Uf, UFO or UAP related records older than 25 years. And so that means technically it says, you know, everything from up to 1999 all the way back to Roswell technically is up for disclosure. And that could be a lot of information. Um, now, the president and uh, they still have the power to, you know, 
block anything they want and claim it's national security or stuff, but they are, I think this technically could lead to a bunch of information getting out. So we'll see about that. And there's been some news coverage. Um, but I got some uh, clips here to play because it's been talked about. And uh, let's see, where do we begin? I'm going to begin with just, uh, I'll, I'll begin with the, the, the fun one. Daniel Sheehan, uh, who I've talked about before, he's a, according to chat GPT, they said he's a well-known American attorney and activist recognized for his involvement in various high profile legal cases throughout his career, covering things in social justice, civil rights, government transparency, um, things with the Pentagon papers and the Karen Silkwood case, which I don't even know what that is, but apparently it's something important. Um, but he went on some podcasts after the UAP Disclosure Act got passed in its current form, and he actually answered uh, the question, because he had said there are definitely alien species, and people finally asked him, well, what kind of aliens are there? And he gave an answer. So I'm going to just let's see if I got to make sure I share my screen correctly so this is recorded. Let's share the whole work this is what he said when asked about philosophical and theological questions that are posed to our human family now by the upcoming discovery of life elsewhere in the universe that's that is, the can you hear that all right i do yeah okay. i'm right. through clear Huge. okay statement that's been right. issued by the vatican okay wow wow so then we've got that we've got the congress now uh, getting set to take control of that information. We've got a president of the United States that has been supportive uh, of a program to have what they call a controlled disclosure campaign uh -huh. uh, taken by the American government. And so they're going to have to reach out to the other uh, major powers on the planet and establish some sort of a cooperative program pursuant to which we all decide how we're going to relate to this extraterrestrial civilization. We mm -hmm. need to find out much more about it. And I'm sure that the intelligence agencies have done research on this yeah. so that they know that there's there's at least a half a dozen uh, different species. You know, there's the small grays, there's the tall grays that they refer to them as, uh, there's the, the, rep, the reptilian people. And it's extremely important for people to understand the reptilian people, a lot of people have extraordinarily positive things to say about them. You know, uh, that uh, Barbara Lamb, for example, who's a major uh, respected person in the UFO community, has had a direct face-to-face -face encounter with one of the reptilian beings who was extremely loving, extremely positive, uh, uh, and, and, and was not frightening. Uh, you know, so the, the, this, is, this is like an extraordinary moment in the no, history. No, it's so extraordinary. So that was, that was one, uh, and he actually... Um, I'm going to play another clip where he covers the alien species question again before we talk about it. That's you know, true. That yeah, this is important to be able to talk directly to the people. Great, thank you. So uh, Brian Johnson has asked, uh, you've spoken before about an ET civilization, presumably one in which the United States government, military and or intelligence communities has had repeated contact. In the spirit of disclosure, are we talking about greys, human-like, but clearly not us, or human-looking and pretty much indistinguishable from us, or are we looking at a multi-species civilization? It's a multi-species civilization. There's there's no doubt about that. You know, that they're the small greys. They're only like about four feet, three and a half to four feet tall. There are the tall greys that are as much as like six feet tall. Uh, there are the reptilians, as they're called, uh, that, that are actually strangely uh, attractive and, and not frightening <laughs> to, to some people. Uh, and th then we have the what they call the. Yeah, this is oh, that clip cuts him off right before he says the insectoid or mantis. Oh, thing. I was going to ask about that, the insectoid or mantis. Oh, yeah. Cool. So I don't have the, uh, but he does. He he mentions those. Um, so those are the first two clips uh, we could discuss, and I've got more. Boy, oh boy. But that was, I mean, people on Twitter, they were on X, whatever, 
they were just like, oh my gosh, he's just moved up reptilian alien disclosure by years. I mean, he's the first really major player in the UFO disclosure uh, movement that straight up has named the species and and named reptilians for I mean for some reason nobody talks about the reptilians they I mean I go to all these conferences and they don't have they have gray aliens but they don't have reptilian aliens they don't have pictures of them they don't have masks I mean it's I mean it's not completely true when I the the only co the conference I went to McMinnville in Oregon where they had a uh um they had a, a a famous uh flying saucer photograph and sighting i think back in the 50s uh that conference is the only one where i did see a couple of people in reptilian alien costumes they were there was someone in a predator costume from the the movie's predator which i think is basically kind of like a reptilian alien but there was a there was a guy in a slee stack costume which is you know slee stack is from the old show land of the lost where they literally these things look like human reptilian aliens that lived underground in this world. But there was someone in a full slee stack costume at McMinnville. What, how do but, you spell that? I need to look that up. What do you slee stack? S L yeah, S L E A S T A C K. I think. Okay. All right. I'll check it out. And uh, let's see, just so it gets on the recording. Maybe I'll just like on my screen, I will. It might okay. It's actually, I guess it's S L E E S T A K. Got it. Uh, and I'm showing it on the screen. If you're, you're still seeing my share, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is a slee stack. Land okay. lost. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. Um. But but that uh. So in those clips though, wasn't it fascinating that in both clips he names these all these major alien types. But the minute he says reptilian, he immediately emphasizes they are some of them are really attractive. Some of them are really nice and yeah. peaceful and friendly. He's like he's like really trying to immediately dispel what I think he must know is this like characterization in some areas that these reptilians are in incredibly evil or there's a, there's a big right wing you know, uh, a very weird right wing uh, conspiracy that I mean, basically, that seems to be claiming it does say that the reptilians can uh, shape shift, but they there's a lot of talk on the right wing claiming that Democrats or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama are reptilian aliens. And then there's people, of course, that claim Trump is. It, it's sort of it's this weird political aspect. Yeah, of <laughs> I'm probably. Thing. I don't know. We could any all of us could be reptilians. I think part of us could be. I mean, we might be spliced in a little DNA there somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, but that was interesting. Uh, any thoughts on that before I play another clip for you? Sure. You want you want to want to hear another one? I would love to. Yes. Okay. So Tucker Carlson, uh, you know about, uh, you know who he is, right? Yeah. Okay. So he, he, there's a couple things. Um, he interviewed David Grush. It's a great interview to listen to the, the whistleblower who basically says he's reported to the inspector general that where the CIA and them are hiding alien crafts and biological specimens. And he went on and, it's going to play this one. He went on this thing called the Tim Pool podcast. And because he, he now believes something is going on. Um, and this is where he sort of gives his assessment of what these things are. It's my personal belief based on a fair amount of evidence that they're not aliens. They've always been here. Um, and, I, and I do think it's spiritual. That's, that's my view. So, and, and again, it's not provable, but based on uh, on the evidence, I think. I'm with you. Absolutely. But, 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 well, if the U.S. government has, in fact, had contact, direct contact with these beings, whatever they are, I've already told you what I think they are, and has entered into some sort of agreement with them, which is which is the claim of, of informed people, um, I would say, whether they're right or wrong, I can't say conclusively. Yeah. But, 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 yeah. but, but if that is true, I mean, it's a very, very, very heavy thing. Yeah. Are you, well, a, a lot of people say well, interdimensional well, beings. Right, I, I want to ask, are, you, are you angels and demons, or how would you well, describe these, these beings? You know, I... These are, again, I'm getting into the realm of conjecture, so I just want to say that flat out. Entity. But one thing I know for a dead certain fact, having seen it, is that 
Um, there is good and evil. We are being acted upon at all times. And I think every person can feel that in himself. I mean, there are moments when you are moved to do things that are much better than you actually are, and they're also more evil and destructive than you actually are. You are subject to forces from outside yourself. That is absolutely true. Now, we can argue about what they are, but every person in the room, if he's reflective, will tell you, yes, I know what you're talking about. And so there are forces that are not human, that do exist in a spiritual realm of some kind, that we cannot see, and that when you think about it, sort of make you think we live in an ant farm. Yeah. <laughs> Being, yeah. Right? And that's Absolutely. just, that is real. Yeah. Okay. When I, and, and there... Wow. Oh yeah. my goodness. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, isn't it fascinating? Uh, it's fascinating that he is saying he's really emphasizing this is a spiritual thing and it's about good and evil. I mean, he's really saying, um, when he, you know, at the beginning, he says, I'll just play that at the, at the beginning. He says, they're not aliens. He says, they've been here the whole time. And it's, you know, let me just play that. It's my personal belief based on a fair amount of evidence that they're not aliens. They've always been here. Um, and I, and I do think it's spiritual. Yeah. So he's, uh, and he, and he's connecting it to inside of us. They, they talk, uh, these guys go off on this conversation about the soul. And a lot of these guys are very Christian. He's Protestant. One of the guys there is Catholic. And so they're basically in the realm of the angels and demons. You know, they're, they're saying it's about, um, they're basically saying that these, these, the aliens or the phenomenon are spiritual related to aliens and demons. And that's, and, and, you know, it seems like they are leaning, they're probably going to say the reptilian aliens are demons. I mean, I just seem, it seems like that's where they're basically heading as opposed to Sheehan, who is saying there's all these different aliens and he's immediately saying, and there are reptilian aliens, but they're not all evil. You know what I mean? It's like. Yeah. And he, he also, he also, uh, Sheehan also says that these are extraterrestrial intelligences. So, so he's saying they're not from here. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of have a sense of both of these that, that it's, it's a non-local, non-linear uh, consciousness that something has access to. Cause I can, when I'm in meditation, I can pick up on, you know, I'm just receptive to, to things that I'm hearing. And uh, it's not me. It's just wherever it's coming from. It's like listening to voices in another room somewhere. Um, so I, I don't know where it's coming from. Maybe it's from here. Maybe it's extraterrestrial. Maybe it's <laughs> nowhere. Um, what, what's your thought on that, Matt? What, are they physical? Are they uh, non-physical? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, they're definitely see. There's definitely a physical aspect to these UFOs and these phenomenon and the aliens. There's, I definitely, there's enough stories that convince me that these things can physically manifest, and that that it seems clear that there is physical material and evidence. So, but there also seems to be overwhelming evidence that these things at least have technology that can basically make them invisible or go through walls and things and in their um and also there seems to be tons of uh, anecdotal evidence that they can go straight into your mind and telepathically communicate with people and and potentially manipulate what you perceive and feel inside your mind so um I mean, I guess from a philosophical point of view, the, the, the truth is we can't know really what the nature of the world is. I mean, we could be living in a computer simulation. All of physical reality could be uh, just actually information fed to our mind through neurons. So um, in that sense, you know, I mean, technically, yeah, they might not be physical at all, but the whole world might not be physical. So, <laughs> wow. yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I've got I've got another clip for you. This one actually is I'm more excited about uh because it's from it's it's quotes from this guy, I don't know how to say it, Sada Guru. Sadguru, okay. Yeah. Do you know him? Yeah, yeah. He's he's got a YouTube channel. 
Yeah. Well, he uh he got it. Thought I had it. Cued up here. Um, let me stop this share, and I'm going to. I'll say also. Um, I know from um studying buddhism um that that buddhists believe in extraterrestrials so yeah. you know there's no discrepancy there that this isn't an even an issue and of course they believe in various realms of consciousness and communication through telepathy yeah well uh here's a little bit of what uh Sadhguru, uh apparently now is saying about nagas mm, yeah when we say Naga, you are just thinking of a snake that lives in these hills or elsewhere. But in this cosmos, there are many other manifestations of Naga which are not of human origin. We do not know who created them, definitely not human beings, but they are floating around in the cosmos and doing their own thing. Whoever wants to perceive, whoever wants to dig deeper into life, for them it's always been available. Well, Adiyogi is carrying a naga around his throat. This represents that aspect of you where you're able to perceive something which your senses cannot perceive. Every major event in my life is always punctuated with the presence of naga. Where the five senses fail, there the work of the naga begins. I'm going to jump ahead here. Major event in my life is always punctuated with the presence of naga. I didn't seek this, it always happened in the early part of my life when I started closing my eyes. I didn't do anything particular, just close my eyes, the need to open my eyes was gone. So if I sat in a place somewhere in some hills or some forests, for five hours if I sat with my eyes closed, when I opened there would be twelve, fifteen cobras sitting there and waiting. They were my first uh, disciples but they were not my disciples, I was the disciple because it took me some time to realize that they are perceiving something more easily than I'm trying to perceive. In a much simpler way, they're able to perceive. It took some time for me to keep the human part of my intellect down and just perceive things like a naga. Uh, what is this about? When did Sadhguru become this kind? He's always been this kind. It's just that it's important that in today's world, everything needs to be logically correct. Being logically correct will take us to a certain point. Beyond that, unless you know how to evolve your logic where it will touch the magic of life, otherwise we get stopped by our own logic. All right, let me, I'm going to jump back here where he says, he references what is said in scripture and stories about the Naga. Mm -hmm. Why, as you see, Adiyogi has Naga upon his shoulder, because Adiyogi is making a statement, he's as good as me. So as a part of this, both many forms of energetic forms of Nagas were created and left loose in this cosmos, some of them these manifestations are made by human beings, but there are many other manifestations of Naga which are not of human origin. We do not know who created them, definitely not human beings, but they are floating around in the cosmos and doing their own thing. Whoever wants to perceive, whoever wants to dig deeper into life, for them it's always been available. Every... So, yeah, so that's... That's uh... fascinating. <laughs> You know, and I have done some uh, some research on nagas and the serpents and the you know dragons and the snakes, and every culture has their their stories, their mythological stories. Um, so, isn't this fascinating? Um, yeah, and and I think it's all the same thing. And I, you know, when you dream about snakes, and I did a little dream interpretation when I was a kid. I used to try to interpret everybody's dreams and I learned that when you dream about snakes that are slithering around on the you know ground and and their heads are down and they're just you know sliding along this is an indication of uh, unenlightened energy which um, you know a lot of times will come out in uh, 
desire and sex and addiction. So that's all the lower chakra energies. But when you dream about snakes that have their heads raised up, and you can see the symbology of when the Buddha was enlightened, you can see the big serpents coming up behind over him, shadowing over his head. It's like they, they protect him. And so that's a symbol of enlightenment and wisdom. So, so the, it's a complicated thing, the whole thing about serpents and snakes and dragons, because on the one hand, they're pretty nasty, but if they, but they have the potential to develop into very high wisdom. That's my understanding of it so far. Is that your take? How do you see it? Just curious. Well, I'm just, I'm just so fascinated. I, it, it really blew me away when, because I've seen his videos. I don't know how to say his name correctly. Sadhguru. 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 Yeah. I mean, I've, I, you know, he's like a, you know, a meditation, spiritual guru, and he's got lots of videos online. I've listened to many of them. I found it very, you know, I, I find him very interesting. And I've, and I had never heard him or any major, uh, you know, meditation or guru related person talk about Nagas or reptilian mm. aliens, which he's basically talking about. And it, and if you listen to that whole, uh, the whole, clip there there he he at some point he mentions it's it's clear he knows he is taking a risk by talking about this openly and he says something about you know how people are now going to think he's crazy like even for him it was like all right if i'm going to talk about this i know i'm going to you know some people are going to be like tune out and yeah <laughs> but it, you know but he's like but it's he's basically saying it's time it, it is time for us to speak openly about this and so he's sort of like Daniel Sheehan, and he's saying Nagas are not evil. These are spiritual, or at least there are some that are spiritual entities that are, and he shows, if you were able to, if you watch the video of what I was showing on the screen, they show, um, you know, these meditators and uh, yogis with the cobra, like right on their shoulder, you know, sort of meditating with them. And, and then he talks about, and him talking about himself meditating in the woods. And when he opens his eyes, there's always like 14 cobras around him. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, that's intense. I mean, that, that is, is intense. Yeah. I've, I've meditated in the woods and um, it is, you know, and it's like, there is something potent and powerful, but I've never had that happen. I've never had a snake. I, I actually had something, uh, I had something happen with some uh, like squirrels and um, like um, <laughs> little beings. Like I was, you know, there was this one time I was uh, I was just standing there meditating in the woods and a it wasn't a squirrel. It was uh, one of those things with a more colorful tail. I can't, the name escapes me. Chipmunk. <laughs> yeah, chipmunk. Okay. And it went up on a branch and it was like sort of just sitting there maybe 15 feet away from me and our eyes were locked. And I just kept looking at its eyes and then it, it just froze there. Like, like, like just like froze, like it was frozen in the matrix. And I, and I sort of walked over to it and it was not moving. I it got all the way. It was completely, I don't know, hypnotized or something or fro like a glitch in the matrix frozen. <laughs> wow. And then yeah. there, there, there was another time I was standing there meditating in a chipmunk. I was standing really still and it might just be that I was being really still, but you know, a sort of chipmunk just sort of appeared about 15 feet away from my feet. And then, and then it starts like, it basically like ran to me to, it was going to like climb me or something. And I like Whoa. screeched and it ran away. But, <laughs> That's know. great. That's amazing. I have found, you know, cause I've had a meditation practice for a long time. Animals are very attracted to, to that energy, whatever it is. And you know, I've, my cat will always sit in my lap and my dog will come and, you know, sit by me. And, and, uh, even my kids I have, when I, when I was raising my kids, they would get up and sit in my lap while I was meditating and they could sit there as long as I did, which was wonderful. We just go into the zone. Um, it's a very inviting feeling. 
And you know that uh, my brother did have an experience in India where he was meditating out in the jungle and he woke up, but he didn't wake up. He opened his eyes and he saw a a big, I don't know if it was a cobra, but it was coming right towards him. (laughs) It kind of freaked him out. Um, So, and, and you know, the cobra or any serpent snake represents the Kundalini. And I think it's all tied in that this is the consciousness that we are wanting to to um, develop this higher consciousness and the kundalini the serpent energy is that is the one that gives us that consciousness you can almost also see how this ties into into the garden of eden right the the serpent in the tree of knowledge it, uh, when i was in college i took uh, anatomy and physiology and you can see how the nervous system looks like a tree and of course sitting right on top of this tree that looks like you know when you're look, just looking at the nervous system the brain looks like an apple sitting on top of a tree and then you have the kundalini wrapping around the spine energetically moving upward towards the the brain and that's that's um i guess when we get to the top we're enlightened right <laughs> well isn't it's, it yeah tied I together. Mean, didn't mean to cut you off okay go ahead well i mean i just i find it so fascinating that there there seems to be this divide between um i mean i i feel like if i grew up in the in a hindu culture where you know they maybe they they talk about nagas like uh sadguru does and maybe that's a part of their culture just like in islamic culture they talk about the jinn it but it seems in our western christian culture it's uh, all of my life the jinn and the naga have not been talked about in my culture like i i've had to i feel like i've had to like be researching this like this edgy topic of ufo and aliens for five years intensely and it took like five years to finally break through enough of this bubble where we are in this western christian culture to see what there's two massive cultures on earth that totally see uh these these aliens basically that can shape shift i mean the the nagas and the the jinn seem very similar a lot of similarities um maybe the the jinn not as much said to be reptilian but but they both you know they have these stories of being able to appear and disappear shape shift um but they but it's interesting that it seems he's saying that they're very they're very in there's a very enlightened aspect of the nagas so that's a very positive enlightened sort of thing he was saying in islamic culture the jinn seem to be on they sort of are both they're sometimes good sometimes bad sometimes tricky and then in but in the christian culture we're like angels and demons and the demons are evil and if you look at what how we depict demons and devils in the christian western world they look very similar to evil monster like you know maybe red aliens or red reptilian aliens uh with giant horns and so it made me think you know is it possible that in the western christian world we are being brought up in a place that at a deep level really wants you to hate and demonize reptilian aliens because because they're maybe they're just the whoever's in control of our western world here and really has been at the deepest level in control of it maybe they are consider themselves enemies of the reptilian aliens but maybe in india uh in the hindu culture they're not maybe they it's actually the opposite and over there it's like no it's just reptilian aliens are actually a good species a good civilization and they're not at all demonized over there and I don't know, maybe they demonize something analogous to that, what we call angels on the Christian Catholic side. I don't, I don't know. I'd have to. That, that is interesting. And, and you could look at China too. China has a, has a lot of culture around the symbol of the dragon and, um, and Australia, they have the whole culture of the, the serpent. Um, Yeah. So I don't know. I think, I do think it's both. I think an unawakened serpent and i relate this to uh the energy of the kundalini uh the unawakened is is 
is fearful it's ego it's oriented towards me 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 it's um it's the lower three chakras it's all about survival and manipulation and cravings but once the kundalini awakens and that begins to move up the spine then suddenly you gain more and more understanding greater perspective and awareness so by the time the kundalini reaches the top into the brain they call it pineal gland and that's where you are actually connected to cosmic consciousness or buddha consciousness or christ consciousness whatever you want to call it it's that that totally enlightened chi energy um and that's that's i think what a lot of these cultures are talking about that it has the potential to tap us into the ultimate uh, consciousness um yeah well, so it can go either way i mean if there's if we just assume there are multiple species and it, it just it makes sense that you know every individual and every species would have the potential for becoming enlightened and you know have in some sense the equivalent of what you're describing kundalini energy inside of them and even if their anatomy is different than us whether or not they have a spine or whatever it's just i mean just like in humans every different countries different races there's there's a diversity of people you know some that are highly enlightened and some that are absolutely not and you assume the same thing goes on in different species even if even if say the reptilians or the grays or the mantids are dominated by one political cultural system you would assume if they have free will there's going to be some members of it that are um free thinkers and think their own way and and so i would hope every species even if they have incredibly rigid cultures and rigid rule sets and hierarchies and perhaps some tragic histories of horrible things their culture has done you assume some of them are enlightened you know and um so I, but it seems there is this like instinct to demonize or say one there is definitely seems to be this instinct to say the reptilians are evil or yeah. but even if like even if you say fine and call them angels and demons you know if you watch enough like uh shows that have really explored universes where there's angels and demons there's always someone who says okay well some demons are good some demons just like some vampires have decided to be good if you say their vampires are real well I mean, the most interesting story is when you imagine a story where now some vampires are good and they've decided not to kill humans and not right. to feed off them because it's like anyone can be enlightened, I would think, or else you don't have free will. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I feel that it depends on, on your karma. I mean, <laughs> it, there are people who would probably never listen to this show just because that's not the realm that they're occupied with. You know, maybe a college student is fully engaged in what they're doing. And this kind of discussion of raising consciousness, you know, is not part of their reality. Um, so when you say it's open to everyone, I think it's it depends on on the person. You know, they may not be ready for any awakening and they're just as Ramdas would say, just running off karma. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so my, my question, Matt, is how are we supposed to um, approach this? And was it David, uh, Daniel Sheehan that said what we need to do is, how, you know, is understand or figure out how we're supposed to relate to these species? Yeah, yeah, that's what he said in his uh, in that first clip. He's like, if this these species exist, we have to basically figure out how we're going to have diplomatic relations with them. Um, and there is actually, I've got a couple. I have a another clip um, to show that this like this got brought up. Someone asking a Trump advisor really aggressively on this, and just to show this is how it's this is like pushing into the um, the mainstream discussion of this election um do you want to hear that one? Oh yeah oh i bet this is going to come up a lot during the election yeah let's I mean, jump you would, into you this would one think so but mm. it there's only been one question at the debate so far but this is a this is a this was a good moment i felt hmm. 
a lot of folks are, are in Washington are, are starting to, to really talk more and more about public disclosures around UFOs. And I know that you spoke, I know you're laughing, but Corey, it's, I mean, a lot, I mean, there was a hearing on the Hill last week, Marco Rubio, other senators really out there asking for more disclosures and your conversations with the president. Uh, what is, what is he going to, to, to say as, as more and more folks are demanding answers on what the government knows, what Trump knew, what Biden knows and why these, they're not just being transparent with the public about what everybody knows. I mean, the, the Trump talks about the deep state and whatnot, but he's never really talked about this. Roger Stone had him on the program and asked specifically about this, uh, and even Trump backed down from, from Roger a little bit on this topic. It, it, so what, 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 where does Trump go with this? Well, look, I'm a person who wants full transparency with everything. Let's find out who killed JFK. It's been 60 plus years. Let's find out what really happened on the 9-11 Commission. Let's find out if there is extraterrestrial life force out there and what threat, if any, they pose to our country. So look, you know, you and I both agree on this. The more transparency, the better. What we have seen, unfortunately, um, is the government has lied to us time and time again. The American people deserve better. And our chief executive officer should be willing to let the American people have all the information and then decide with it from their own prerogative what it entails. But unfortunately, there are too many secrets out there. You know, we continue to protect people that don't have our best interests at heart. And we have seen the intelligentsia community, you know, benefit themselves over the course of the last multiple decades because it is good for their pocketbooks and not good for the American people. So if Donald Trump is the president, I would encourage him to open up the books to all of these things. If there are indiv individuals who are living, who uh, were associated with the JFK assassination, then let's hold them accountable. Let's get the real story out. Let's make everybody with the best knowledge possible. Well, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. And so that was, he's an advisor to uh, Trump, but uh, I got, I got to play another clip for you. This is from, this is a, uh, I think it's just good for people to hear that this is from Schumer, Senator Schumer and Senator Rounds. I won't play the whole thing. I'll just play a little bit. But they, when the NDA um, Act passed, uh, they they went on the Senate floor and they they talked about it. Just you know, the need for transparency. So I'm just gonna play a little bit of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, in the NDAA, I, I see my friend Senator Rounds is on the floor, and ask him to engage in a colloquy on an important set of provisions in the NDAA that deals with transparency, trust, and government oversight the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Dis Disclosure Act that he and I co-sponsored, and portions of which we will pass in the NDAA. I say to my friend that unidentified unanimous phenomena are of immense interest and curiosity to the American people. But with that curiosity comes the risk for confusion, disinformation, and mistrust especially if the government isn't, isn't prepared to be transparent. The United States government has gathered a great deal of information about UAPs over many decades, but has refused to share it with the American people. That is wrong, and additionally, it breeds mistrust. We've also been notified by multiple credible sources that information on UAPs has also been withheld from Congress, which, if true, is a violation of the laws requiring full notification to the legislative branch especially as it relates to the four congressional leaders, the defense committees, and the intelligence committee. So the bill I worked on with Senator Rounds offered a common sense solution. Let's increase transparency on UAPs by using a model that works, by following what the federal government did 30 years ago with the JFK Assassination Records Collection Act. They established a presidentially appointed board to review and release these records, and it was a huge success. We should do the same here with UAPs. Senator from South Dakota, I yield. Thank, thank you, and, and I thank my colleague, uh, the Democrat leader, for the opportunity to speak to this particular issue today. This is an issue that, uh, that I think has caught the attention of the American people, and most certainly the lack of transparency on the matter, which is of real interest to a lot of the folks that have watched from the outside. Uh yeah. Just wanted to play a little bit just to show that this is, uh, I mean, this is, it's like, it's getting, 
it's really like it, it's it's really in Congress. It's really in our they're really looking at this and um it's 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 got to break its way into the presidential election debate. It's it's such a, a hot topic. Um, Isn't it interesting that people are just having a hard time believing it? <laughs> yeah. You know? And, it's, and they are afraid. I mean, they just laugh. Mm -hmm. It like triggers something in their brain. Yeah. Yeah. They just can't make it a reality. <laughs> so, um, so I'm hoping you're, yeah, I'm hoping you're, you're right that during the election year that this will become an issue and people will start to pay attention to it. Um, well, it, it seems it seems so obvious this is tied to the JFK assassination. It's mm -hmm. like when you hear any congressman talk about this, they always bring up the JFK assassination. And I mean, I think, and it's funny that they muddled this Schumer, the UAP Disclosure Act on the uh, the JFK assassination uh, legislation that they put forward because it, you know, it highlights the fact that there are still like a thousand documents they have not released about that. And I think they haven't released it because it it reveals some of the same cover up horror story that uh, is going to be revealed when this the secrets about, you know, the UFO alien cover ups revealed. There's there's some sort of shadow government deep, you know, in the CIA that has been a. Uh, that has been doing some bad things for years and hiding yeah. information and making themselves rich. And, and who who was it that that said, I don't know what during the the congressional hearings or something said, well, how come we don't just, you know, tell exactly what's going on? And the reply was, the public couldn't handle it. Did you do you remember hearing some someone yeah. say that? I can't yeah. remember. It is so, said that is that's something that's been said, I think, over the years as a way to say, you know, it's like it would it would cause the stock market to crash. It would cause society to crumble riots, uh, which, you know, I don't think yeah. is impossible. It right. might happen. <laughs> there, I think there might be some riots. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I think just revealing that, confirming that the CIA basically killed JFK. I, I, I mean, I would think that would be deserving of some riots. But um, yeah, but maybe not. It's it's weird. It's weird what uh, the populace, the population is strangely, I don't know, mesmerized by. It just seems it's it's kind of like what they said in ancient Rome. You know, it was like bread and circus. It's like we've got human population really mesmerized by entertainment and television and lulled oh, yeah. to sleep. It seems. We're just we're just hypnotized. Yeah. 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 And the the flat screens are very addicting and distracting. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we're just not not able to hear what's going on sometimes. Yeah. But but then again, there is there is definitely I mean, they're on Twitter. There is a growing number of people that like even like Tucker Carlson, that's a big deal that he is like, oh, this is real. And yeah. he's clearly concerned and upset about it. He's like, something really wrong is going on here and people like him and people that are getting awakened to this, uh, this, this, there's something really deeply wrong. Um, it seems that that is a growing, it's a growing movement. So I, I don't know. It looks like maybe this will all really break wide open this year and maybe Biden yeah. is just going to disclose aliens at some point. That, wouldn't to... that be nice? I do feel like this year, I mean, the secrecy, people are becoming more and more aware that there's a lot of secrecy going on. And I think just because people are aware of that, it's going to have to come out more in the open. People are going to have to just demand what's going on. Um, Cause it's causing a lot of distrust. Yeah. You know? If we're going to elect anybody that anybody can trust, this stuff has to come out more publicly. That's my feeling. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting times. Interesting times. Well, so why don't we why don't we top it off with a little 10 minute meditation, because this can cause some anxiety for some people or fear, Um, you know, the way people respond to this disclosure, it it may be possible that that people are just going to have their mind blown. (laughs) You know, it's like (laughs) can't handle it. Um, So what do you do in that case? And I always will suggest anybody who's having their mind blown by something is just to sit in silence and in peace and allow the universe to unfold. So with all its mysteries. So why don't we do a little five or 10 minute sit? Sounds, Sounds great. Okay. So I'll invite the listeners to, well, not if you're driving, but if you're just sitting somewhere, let's close our eyes and begin to just sense our immediate surroundings, what's really going on. So what we really have access to is our five senses. So let's tune in with those for just a minute. Let's see, what can we hear? Right in your immediate environment, what do you hear? I hear my dog snoring. I hear birds outside. Refrigerator running. Just take a minute to scan your environment just to see what you can hear. We rely on our senses to move through this world. And when our mind is overloaded and overreactive, we begin to lose touch with what's real. And that's why we wanna just keep simple, tune into your senses. So let's feel your feet on the floor, your butt in the chair, your hands in your lap, whatever you're doing. Maybe feeling pressure, temperature changes, whatever the skin can pick up. When you don't know what's real, at least you can come back to your senses, back to your hearing, feeling, tasting, all of the senses. When the mind wanders off, which it always will, It's the nature of the mind. The meditation practice is to notice it. My mind has gone off on a trail of thoughts again. Noticing it is the biggest step because that gives you choice. You can choose to let it go and come back to your breath, come back to your body. If you have sensations of feeling fearful, any anxiety, find out where that's manifesting in your body. Tight shoulders, tight jaw, clenched fists. Every emotion we have is manifesting in the body somewhere. 
See if you can find it. And just for the last couple of minutes, let's find that place where we can most easily relate to our breathing. Maybe the tip of the nose, the abdomen, and we'll just follow it for a minute. Breathing in, breathing out. You can use your breath as an anchor to hold you here in reality. Or you can use it to just rock yourself into a restful state, breathing in, breathing out. Your breath can be like a sanctuary. You can always come back to your breath. If you can locate where you're holding any fear and anxiety, tensions in your body, just by being aware, paying attention, things begin to relax. And what we want to do with a meditation practice is find out if we can raise our energy a little bit, a little bit higher, more towards compassion, that feeling of acceptance, allowing things to be just as they are. And we'll just begin to trust that the universe knows what it's doing. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Until next time. Bye-bye.